Well, hello everyone. My name is Christopher, or Omukase, and today this is going to be a slightly different video, I think. I think today I wanted to just take some time and voice over a roughly one hour video of me animating a very small prompt. Uh, for context, uh, the animators at Riot, we, have a, we had a community of practice meeting where we had a fun activity. It was about one week before Halloween in 2021. And we all got together and decided that we would take our one hour of community time to all animate a fun prompt related to Halloween. Um, there was an assortment of, of flavors and choices. Uh, they're like, what? Like, uh, I guess death, spooky, candy, cats, pumpkins, all these different things. Um, I got the prompt death, and this is a recording of my session trying to animate something within about one hour. I thought this would be a good video to just sort of like talk over um, a lot of times I feel like we, uh, at least with content, we try to present everything in very, very pretty boxes wrapped all up, wrapped up very nicely, um, for presentation as well as for, you know, information delivery. I feel like a lot of times information delivery, um, just like for teaching is a practice, it's a practice skill and over time you get better and better at doing it. But then also, especially for YouTube content. Everything is edited to be streamlined, where information is just pumped out and put together in such a way that is it's condensed so that you don't waste time. And the interesting thing about that is that people want things all very, very quickly, which it's very, very understandable. But also, in reality, when you're working and when you're just doing stuff, it's never that efficient. It's never... 120% going all out, finishing within the minimum time frame. Um, so, you know, I, th I thought this would be a good video to just like go through real time instead of like a thousand percent faster, right? Um, I know some of my stream VODs are like that, um, but at the same time, I'm focused on animating, so multitasking a lot is a little bit tricky. So, for this video today, I actually wanted to go ahead and go through. Um, a fun, I guess you know, not a fun, but just like impromptu, off the cuff, watch this video, watch this time, watch this recording with you guys and sort of just like, I guess, think about what I was trying to do because you'll notice that, that there's a lot of things I try, mess up, delete later because, oh my God, it's not working. And then time, time keeps ticking, right? So every single second you're trying to do something and it's not working, you're running out of time. And then as that happens, you just have to make amends, right? And um, also, I guess also on top of that, I think for the first this hour, it would be interesting to just answer some general questions about me, what I want to do on the interwebs uh, regarding animation content and my stuff, my regular schedule of uploading content and streaming and just engaging with everything is so sporadic. And this is a pretty obvious thing, mainly just because you know, life is complex, right? Life is complicated. There's so many priorities that we have to juggle. Uh, content creation is a full-time job. If you want to do it, if you want to do a very, if you want to do it well, right? There's uh, you got to stick to a schedule. You got to pump out stuff. You got to edit it. And then again, a lot of people on social media are 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 at the mercy of algorithms and making sure that people can get things seen, which we almost have no control over. Um, but yeah, I uh, sorry that was a long intro for exactly what I want to do. But um, I was I guess I was just trying to give some context to this video. Uh, give me a second as I sip. Whoop, sorry. Some tea. Uh, I just took a shower, so I'm very cozy. So this should be pretty good. 
um, what I'm gonna do right now, what you see here is no video, or at least I think. Uh, I'm gonna hit the play button and we're just gonna watch it together, all right? So here we go. Uh, yeah, so this is a rig that we found. I believe it is free. And all of the animators got to use the same rig. I believe this guy, this little guy is called QB. C-U-B-Y, the QB rig. Um, designed and rigged by, uh, designed and rigged by Francisco Montero. I will provide a link in the description below if you would like to play with it. Uh, but yeah, it's a, uh, we decided to come with, uh, play with a rig that was like, had some ability to emote and be a little bit uh, expressive with squash and stretch and all that stuff because that's the style that most of us at work are somewhat familiar with. Um, but we also wanted it to be a, a you know simple enough that we can do an animation under an hour, right? You'd be surprised a lot of times when, especially as you get better and better at animating, how kind of I guess hub hubris can pop or pop up sometimes. When someone asks you, hey, how uh, how long will this take you? I've learned pretty quickly over time that you always want to overestimate. Overestimate how long it would actually take you to do something. Even if you can do it in 10 minutes, say like 30 minutes or something, right? In real life, there's just so much stuff that happens um, in between, especially at work. Uh, but then also like when you're working, even if... Uh, it's complete. It's like if you're working with something completely unfamiliar, like a rig that you don't know how to use yet, uh, there can could, can be technical problems and difficulties that you'll run into. So, always baking in what is it called? Floof. Baking in uh, buffer. Oh, English is hard, guys. Always accounting for that um, is important, I think. So here you can see, uh, I am keying something on the 60th frame. And I think what I was trying to do here was that just choose something like a time frame, like a time time that specifically was like, okay, roughly two seconds. Two seconds doesn't sound too hard to animate in one, in one hour, right? If it's simple. Um, again, the, the prompt I got was death. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to start uh, with death pose. So you could see that's why I like laid in backwards on the ground. Um, that basically sets the whole tone of how I'm gonna construct this, right? So what you wanna think about, especially in something like this, where I didn't, basically I didn't even think about anything I was gonna be doing for this assignment until literally the one hour like timer started. Um, so the easiest thing sometimes in these situations is you just want to kind of you know fly by the seat of your pants Go with your instinct, uh, less thinking, more doing. And sometimes this is actually an interesting thing too, where it's like when you're doing stuff, you actually react and learn more and you're dynamically interact and like dynamically responding to the process, right? If you're trying to plan too much uh, in the beginning, trying to be too perfect, you kind of like freeze up your own, your yourself in terms of how you work and your own process. Granted, you do want to do some planning, right? You want to have a game plan. You want to have like a goal and like a drive but at the same time it, it's important i think to be somewhat flexible um and this is also something that i do i basically when i'm posing stuff i post stuff out pretty roughly and you can see that for example i've keyed on 0 5 10 15 and 20 so every five this is completely arbitrary i, I right now i'm not really thinking about timing or spacing right now really all i'm thinking about is what is the story I'm trying to tell? And I think right now what I'm trying to figure out is basically like, okay, so I'm going to have QB at the end be dead on his back. Uh, and I think in the beginning, actually, that which this is not how it, this is not the final. In the beginning, I wanted to do something a little bit more interesting where it's like QB runs into scene and then either trips or something happens where he just like dies. I think tripping and like flipping over was how I wanted to go. Oh, that's a neat thing too, that um the rig comes with like eye shapes. So yeah, sometimes you wanna be um 
use what's what use what you have available to you the rig came with some features and while i was playing around with it there were a couple features that i could just kind of like piggyback off of and this obviously helps in communicating uh qb's unfortunate state at the end so you can see here what i'm doing is i'm blocking out the positioning so this is like i would consider this like staging at this point um staging to sort of like get an understanding of like okay the scene how is everything going to play out uh do how much space do i need uh and yeah just uh here i'm fiddling with the the sword because i'm because uh, i think i'm like i don't understand how this is rigged so let's test out a couple of the rotations how it moves all that stuff it is one of those things where for example this controller which is on the hand oh that's rough scaling and yeah, this is one of those things where for 3D animation, it's very common, right? You get a rig, some behavior is not perfect. You know, and that's just how it is. Um, wait, let me just double check. Am I recording? <laughs> okay, I should be recording. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of times if you have a rigger, if you're working on a project, then hopefully you can have like conversations back and forth about what kind of needs you have. Um, but then in this situation, you have one hour, you got to do it. So you just got to, okay, well, if this is not going to scale correctly, then we're just going to have to not scale it, right? Uh, got to just be loose and flexible. Go with the flow. But yeah, I think right now it's just, just uh, trying to figure out the ultimate game plan. How much time has passed at this point? Convert this into frames and time code. So about seven minutes has passed. That's almost about one eighth. About one eighth of time has passed. And we have what? Kind of like one pose. Oh wait, did I just delete everything? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, I am talking over, I am doing a voiceover of this video about two months after we animated this. So I don't, I have my memory of what I'm doing here is actually not that great. But I think, okay. So initially I think this is what happened. I think initially I wanted the QB to just like run in, run into the scene and then like fall over or something with the sword would happen. Um, but then I think I realized like, okay, running in now and then doing all those poses and then splining it and all that, sh and all that stuff is going to take forever. Um, there's a situation where it's like, you want to do running, you got to do each step, you got to do all the up and down, you got to do all the stretches and then you got to do the tripping. And then the tripping has a section where you need to like rotate and then fall and you need to come in and all that stuff. That actually, I think given that like seven to eight minutes had already passed, I made a decision where was like, that's too complicated. I cannot move this character. We're just gonna have him stand and then die, right? This simplifies greatly. And I think that was a smart move because I barely finished on time. And the point wasn't to finish necessarily for this, for this uh, project. I was just kind of uh, challenging myself to see if I could like get myself to do something uh, within that time frame. And uh, in the end, I think it worked out. So right now what I'm doing, I'm doing an interesting thing where it's like, okay, so doing this whole pose, 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 and then blocking and then sliding and stuff, that's gonna take freaking too long, right? So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, okay, I'm actually gonna be doing something where he's standing and then the sword will come in, slash him, and he's gonna fall over and die. And one way that I decided I think I could do that faster was by basically telling the whole story through one control, which is this is something that probably a lot of you students have done or practiced, which is like layering. You take one control, you do a spline pass on on it, and then you use that one control to do a lot of the the pillar, like the acting beats for your entire scene. And then you build a lot of the motion out outward from that kind of driver, right? Um, a lot of times that actually is a lot faster um, because this is much more workflow curve oriented versus pose oriented. 
And there are a lot of different ways where you can layer in poses as you're doing this kind of thing. Um, I think for 3D, that is probably one of the faster ways of doing stuff. It is true that you lose a little bit of specificity, especially with more complicated characters that have lots of different drivers. Um, something like this with just Q is just literally a box. Um, you just move the root, it moves everything, and then you have all the other aspects on the cube follow either leading or, or dragging, right? And that makes it simple. So you can think about this process I'm doing here as just a way to save time um, because I don't have to juggle so many different things at once. All I have to think about is this one motion. Okay, how do I get everything to just like complement that one motion? Uh, and so what I'm doing here is I am posing out the extreme portion where it starts out kind of T-posed, it ends uh, in a dead pose, and then I think right now I'm trying to figure out sort of like what is the maximum uh, or the extreme of the entire story. And this extreme here for the antic is basically the sword is going to come into scene, go up into the air, have an antic where like right before it slices, it goes up and then phew, slices and hits the uh, hits QB. I just realized when I say QB, it sounds like QB, which is kind of, uh, which is the cat from Madoka Magica. Or at least that's what pops into my head. Uh, I think right here, what's happened, I'm trying to observe basically like what are the best controls for me to use to animate this motion. Um, And I think I'm getting this. I'm think I'm getting kind of distracted on like, how do I get it to be bigger? Should I make it bigger? How do I get a, some smears and stuff? I think this is what I'm, I'm like observing right now. Uh, yeah. Then I'm really just blocking out and putting out like tentpoles of like where I want things to be at specific times. I think currently the one of the main main things is just figuring out the position of the of the sword i did also realize that prior um it's one of those things where like i wanted something where qb i think qb was like running with a sword and then trips and stabs himself or something which i think was the intention but then i realized that like the parent spaces stuff i haven't set that up yet i can't get into his hand and then i have to get in his hand and then out of his hand after it stabs him and gets stuck in his and it's stuck in his body oh you can see how like all that kind of stuff if you don't plan ahead will require time to set up and uh, we want things to sort of be done within an hour so you know got to reprioritize uh, here I am posing out the opening frames trying to get some offset yeah trying to get some offset uh, on the beginning pose where he's like not straight on he's just like looking into the looking onto the side side of the screen which is where the sword will come in from. And as the sword flies in, he will track the motion, look up as it goes up, and then get swiped to death. But yeah, there's one thing that um you might, I may have not touched upon, but I do touch upon it in some of my um, older videos. Uh, where at least in this situation one of the tools I'm not using any real tools here except for like a tween machine um, I've explained that for my tween machine on D I do favor left to favor left key and then on F I do favor to right key this makes help this, this, this helps me just basically do in betweening really really fast um, it's very very messy it's very automatic it is not something that you want to use for final stuff uh, it is just to get stuff in really quickly and get a sense of like spacing. Uh, also, another thing that I do is I try to do something where it's like key all curves. Uh, no, all NURBS curves, so all controls. Um, and anytime you see keys on the timeline, it usually involves me selecting all controls and keying them because uh, I know they're in the layered process, there are ways to manage offsets on keys and then you can be very clean by not adding key like keyframes on all the controls at all frames um i think in layered mode if you're very practiced in layered and you do it that way i think it's pretty efficient and beautiful to do it that way 
but I, I've, I've noticed that at least for my workflow at work, as well as like when I open other people's uh, scenes and share my scenes with other people, it's just simpler when a key on the timeline means everything is in keyed on this key. It's just a lot easier to like, do you, like, do you have to worry? Like you wouldn't, don't have to worry about like, oh, I'm going to move this one, this pose, and it's not going to inherit. It's not going to keep the previous values because it was on this control. It wasn't keyed on this frame it was keyed prior and blah, blah blah right so a lot of times that can be kind of problematic <clears throat> experimenting with a little bit of uh stretching and squash i think i'm trying to author in like an impact frame sword comes down then his body reacts to being hit on contact. <clears throat> um, I think right now also, I would like to add in some, uh, I did ask on Twitter just because, I don't know, it's my first time doing something like this. Uh, a Q and A, because I didn't know if I could like fill in the entire hour with just speaking about myself working. I feel like that's kind of, boring not boring probably still pretty interesting to hear about what i'm what i'm thinking about but uh variety is the spice of life huh so having variety of discussions and topics and all that stuff is more interesting but yeah so i have about i have a handful of questions here that i actually don't have not thought about or, or read prior i just wrote them down uh and they are, they, I just asked on Twitter basically if anyone had any questions that they wanted me to answer in this video. And I put them here and I shall answer them now. The first one is from Raymond. Uh, Raymond asks, any recent revelations and recent reflections about your work, life, game, etc.? What's something you thought you knew, but later found out you were wrong about? Oh, that's a very serious, deep question. Recent revelations. I, I think for my work, I've gotten... So when I first started working in the industry, I think when we all enter, we're all very obsessed and focused on becoming better animators, right? sidebar you can see me this is the impact frame that i'm trying to do like the it's basically uh sword smashing into him and then basically what you want is like okay so the impact frame is sword on the ex on like a contact extreme body wherever it's hit is the leading point and then everything else has to like energy wise be flowing out from that right and then you can see here that i'm trying to author a frame one or two frames immediately after as a bounce so like impact coming down boom then he bounces up. So then after you do one C, you want to do an inverse C because that's how rebounds and forces work, right? Uh, and then I guess a little smear there. Uh, going back to the question. So we're all focused on trying to get better. And what's interesting is that I've gotten to a point now after being in the industry for about six years. Uh, m my level of work can always be better. I think all of us are always striving to continue to improve, uh, to climb that mountain of craftsmanship, high level of craftsmanship. Um, but what becomes really interesting as you become more veteran in the industry is that if you, you can always stay an artist, right? You can always continue just doing IC work and just generating animation or whatever art form you do. Um, I think that's very perfectly respectable. And then there's people who are very, very good at it. Um, but if you are working at a place, either like a small company or a big, or like a team of, of artists, the next level actually is exercising your craft skills, not in the capacity to generate more work, but to force multiply and amplify your value to others, right? So that means if you're at a level where you're pretty decent at animating, it's not about just continuing to animate more, right? It's, it's about sharing your knowledge and lifting other people up. And then this relates to, uh, 
consequentially to leadership and uh, you know empowering others, developing teams. And it's been it's actually very very interesting where uh, when we first start animating. We're very concerned and, and focused on the individual aspect but then as you participate in the system a lot more and on teams and where you understand that you are actually just a very small part of the team in terms of making this you know the product a success what becomes very apparent is that good leadership makes or breaks how effective the team is and for me that has been a very big revelation and something I'm inspired by. And also something that I'm just interested in like learning and getting better at. I think one of the skills that's like very, very intrinsically related to this is, uh, you know, social skills, uh, interaction with human beings. I've always been someone that's like quiet and reserved and just wants to be by myself all the time. And I don't know. I think it's fascinating that at, at this point at my in my career, as well as my age, I guess, I'm slowly growing to be more of like, oh, I think it's 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 okay and more comfortable for me to be putting myself out there, trying to interact with people and learn about their experiences and connect with them, right? Uh, before in high school and in college and even after college, that was never a thing. That was that that was just really hard for me. Um, but when I see other people that are in like leadership or management roles and they do a good job and they help other people. I don't know, it's really like, really inspiring. But it's interesting too, because I know for me, that's a skill I'd never developed. And uh, it's also a skill that not many people tell you you need to develop, especially if you're like focused on being an artist, right? Like it's like just the first, the first, the first requirement is to just be good at it, right? That's what we're all, con all like worried about in the beginning. Am I good enough? Am I good enough? Mm, imposter syndrome um but then in the end it's interesting because then after that there's just like all this other stuff to learn uh obviously the first step for most students is getting their foot in the door right getting into the industry but it's kind of the same thing right if you think about like going back to high school and you're applying for college let's say you go to college not everyone goes to college and it's not necessary for art but let's say you go to college and you're applying for college Applying, presenting yourself, and getting in is the first step. And then after that, you have four years of freaking figuring out, figuring out how to study, figuring out what you want to major in or graduate with. And then, and then I guess the third thing is like, just like figuring out how to just be a person, like living by yourself and interacting with other human beings at a university or college, right? Away from home. It's a very big change. And every step of the way, there's always things that people never really really taught teach you and you just gotta learn it by yourself anyway i guess the um the funny thing here is that like yeah like when i made my decision to go into art or go into animation i was just like i just want to be a good animator and, oh i i found out that i really like doing this whole process and it's very fun but uh i don't know that's just such a small part of the long journey um, so I guess in the end like for all of you people who are trying to get into the industry and then start working there's there's so much so much so much in the future so much ahead of you guys um, that it's very very fun so think big picture it's not all about immediate results, right? There's so much more that you could be doing now too that will help you in the future. Um, oftentimes it's always about, oh, how do I get in? How do I start? How do I how do I pass this and pass that and all that stuff? And it's like, yeah, 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 it's true. Um, but give it some time. And if it's something that you, do, if you if it's something that you deeply want, um, life is just so much more multifaceted than just getting in. That didn't sound as eloquent as I wanted it to be. Anyway, uh, so I think right here, I am taking all the controls and I have basically authored most of the extreme stuff that I wanted. So it's like in the beginning, you have a couple of like the standing frames. Then here where you have a higher density of uh, frames around 
I'm using the 40 range. 40, 50, 50, 53, around 53 to 60. You can see that they're a lot um, closer together. And that's mainly because I'm just trying to author a lot of the more specific, specific parts where it's like, oh, looking up, it's blinking. Oh, the eyes cha eye shapes are changing. The sword is coming down. On high intensity actions and beats, you do need a little bit more definition and frames to correctly express your idea, right? And here I'm <laughs> making him freak out. Um, and then yeah, I was just recently just like prior to that, I was just retiming stuff. I was retiming stuff so that it feels like it feels it has the motion of whoopa, whoopa, whoopa. Um. Again, when you're doing these poses in the beginning, you can just put them wherever you want on the timeline. They don't need to be timed out. Because again, when you're posing, the, the main priority you have is to is the pose telling the story correctly. Then after that, you want to figure out what is the timing? What is the spacing? How, how, how should it feel, right, in motion? Those are two separate things. I think what's interesting about, especially just with like animation is that depending on how you work, it's not all linear. It's not all just sequential of one, two, three, four, this is how you do it done there's a lot of going back and forth right sometimes for some things you need more spine or just more poses or more specificity it's very very dynamic um so i think like when you're working being okay with jumping back and forth is is is, is not a bad thing um everyone works very very differently uh, i tend to try to keep like a north guiding star but then my entire process is kind of kind of ad lib most of the time i do i do follow certain structures for certain assignments um like blocking and then blocking plus and this line that is my normal workflow and a lot of times it's much more helpful because i it, it gives me structure so that i can present stuff to my peers at regular times um and it's also just good training to to learn different things um but like this one i again it we are 26 minutes through the hour about halfway through and i'm panicking because we haven't really animated anything we just hit it, animated basically this like contact pose <laughs> and then a little bit of a little bit of bounce on the root right um so again with this this situation you just got to be like oh this is how much time i have left okay make make amends keep moving keep moving keep moving don't stress out too much So I don't know what this thing is called, but in Korean in Korean grocery stores, they have this like tea gel, not gel, <laughs> tea paste, tea paste, tea. Uh, oh no, jam! It's like jam. It's like really condensed flavored jam that you mix with hot water, and then, then basically you just get like flavored uh, fruity flavor. I mean, if you get the fruit flavor, it's like fruity flavored tea. And the jam like dilutes into the water, the warm water. It is like my favorite thing because it is so damn easy to just make and it just tastes so cheap good. Not cheap and like, oh, it tastes bad cheap, but like it's like an easy life hack. I don't have to roast and like soak tea leaves and all that stuff and blah, blah, blah. I literally just go to the refrigerator, grab a spoon, go plop into my cup, and then I just put hot water in and just mix it. And it tastes great. I don't know what it's called. I don't think I, I can't read Korean, but whenever I happen to pass by one, I always look for it. I I typically get the lemon flavored one. That's what I'm used to. But I'm always open. I'm open to trying new ones. I've never been a big fan of the ginger, the ginger, ginger type. Maybe I'm a scrub. Who knows? Okay, well, I hope that answered the first question. Second question is from... Guess I hate you. Uh, the question is, how to become this good at animating? LOL. But seriously, how did you start and what motivated you? Ooh. So thank you for the compliment, first off. Uh, I would not really consider myself very good at animating. I mean, I am I guess I'm decent enough to be working in the field, but I mean, I've always felt like my stuff is very, very pale in comparison to a lot of my peers. But I, 
I appreciate I appreciate the uh, the compliment and the good words, kind words. Uh, but I can answer the other question a little bit more. Oh, I mean, this is the question: How how did you start, and what motivated you? Uh, so, animation. I I got exposed to it in terms of like three D in architecture school when I went to uh, university. Um, I always did like anime and I always did like watching animated TV shows. Uh, I, th I think I grew up on stuff like Arnold and Dragon Tales and Cyber... Cyber Squad? Cyber... All these PBS kids shows, right? Um, and I mean, you know, I guess kids just like animated stuff. But then when I got into anime and started watching like Ghibli stuff, Ghibli, Hikaru no Go, Inuyasha, that stuff got me really, like, I, I really enjoyed the vibe and the art and like how expressive and cool and epic and fantas fantastical everything was. Uh, so that was a big influence. But then I didn't start doing 3D animation specifically until college of my second year. Uh, I was able to sort of enroll in a graduate school class where we were able to do... Uh, learn Maya and we were learning Maya mainly just because it was a, it was a helpful tool to basically um, model spaces for architecture and uh, basically render areas to communicate to clients what the space would look like right and yeah that uh, that was my first exposure to it I found that that part of just build like rendering buildings was really boring and so for the assignments that were given in the class I tried to then ask the professor if I could like twist twist these assignments into like animation assignments and you know he gave me uh, he gave me the uh, okay uh, and fortunately fortunately I was able to basically just go ham on these assignments and I think these were the first like, uh, animations I've ever, ever did. I did post something on Twitter a while ago um, which was basically showing my first animation I ever did on my own like opening a book, reading about animation how to animate and then basically trying to do my first walk cycle and uh, god it's such a long time ago that was all self taught but I, I do distinctly remember when the first time I did that after, I was like, what? It's like 3 a.m. in the morning when I finished like my first walk cycle. And when I looked at it, I was like, holy fuck. I'm a wizard. Like I had magic powers like flying off my fingers. I was like, look at what I made. It's so amazing. And now you look at it. It's like, what the fuck? What the heck is that? Um, And yeah, that was my first exposure to it. That was in 2011. 2010 or 2011 but that was what that's like what got the wheels going it definitely wasn't something that I ever thought I was actually going to be doing I, I was still struggling at the time with deciding about whether I wanted to do architecture if I wanted to be a doctor all these different things and so I just did that for a little bit and then I I quit architecture school <laughs> oh bye bye a school uh, and then, so I guess the next time I came around was in 2013 in the summer. I had graduated university. I decided, I had decided that I wasn't going to be pursuing uh, medicine at that time. And I ended up taking a class at this place called Animation Collaborative. This is in Emeryville. It is across the street from Pixar, uh, Pixar Animation Studios. And I enrolled in an intensive demo and lecture class with Michael. I do not know how to pronounce his last name because I'm such a dumb butt, but I believe it's like Makowitz. Ma Michael Ma My Michael Mako. Michael M. Let's just say Michael M. I will post the name here. Michael M. Uh, he currently, I believe, is a is a lead animator. I am not sure what terms they use at Pixar, but he's some sort of senior lead, uh, principal, whatever, you know, kind of big shot animator uh, working on some of the films. At the time, uh, he was giving a one week class every day for five days of, in a week for one week. Uh, I think the classes were about four or five hours, maybe six. 
uh, perhaps eight, where he basically was sort of just like overviewing his process, giving insight into his background and how he did his shots. And oh my God, that class was the freaking bomb. I, if any of you are able to take that class, uh, back then it was all in person, but now I believe they offer all of them uh, virtually now. If any of you can take his, my, if any of you guys can take Michael's intensive and demo lecture class, I 2000% recommend that you do. It is literally what convinced me to want to become an animator full time. I distinctly remember that summer when I took the class, that was literally the reason. And uh, the slide that he was talking about at the time when I made that decision was specifically, he was sort of, he was showing, Michael was showing specifically his shot in Ratatouille. Um, oh God, I need to remember what the character's name was. Do, 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 do. Skinner. Okay, so in Ratatouille, there's a scene. Obviously, uh, the most fam one of the most famous ones is when Ego eats the Ratatouille and is sent back into his past, uh, in terms of just like remembering his mom's cooking. And then he was talking about that, which was all very, very, very cool. But then there was just one shot that he was explaining, showing, which was basically for Skinner, where when Skinner also ate the Ratatouille, uh, he went through like eight different emotions within a span of a couple of seconds. But what's so fascinating is that like, that's something that just like feels so organic because people who humans, when they express things on their faces, their thoughts are pretty like straightforward, but the emotions that are associated with the thoughts and how they get expressed on the face is so layered and multi-complex. Um, I am nowhere near this kind of level, but uh, after Michael was basically explaining sort of like his understanding of how humans convey emotion, how they, how eye darts happen when people are thinking, which directions, the asymmetry of expressions on faces, how skin moves on the face and all this like elasticity. And then basically how that all combined all together to contribute to this one scene for Skinner where he was expressing all these, these emotions and such as like, for at first anger and then curiosity and then surprise and then dismay and like i don't know maybe regret or just like like disbelief disbelief and then into a anchor again or just like whatever like it's just one 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 but for the for the acting and the emotional moment for the for the movie it nails it on the head and i believe that's like some one of the things where it's like animators animators really strive to to express themselves and, and execute on these particular these particular intense human moments and the magic comes from when we're able to sort of express that right well, there's there's a terminology that most of us use all the time right which is like oh animators are just actors but they act through the thing right I, I am an actor but i act on i don't do it on the stage i do it in the computer or something right and i think that's pretty true um there's always a lot of like physicality and technical stuff that we can all learn and and discuss and then get better at but i think the meat of it is is like can you tell a story can you communicate emotion because that's what that's what makes it magical to like to live in right i don't know life is just so interesting and so beautiful in some in so many ways that um animation is an art form that allows you to sort of like capture capture something real but just like it's not physical it's like a meta thing no no not even meta that's a bad word it's like the spirit and personality. I think this is a big thing too. It's like, oh, personality. Everyone talks about animation as personality, personality. And I think that's true, even though it's like waved around a lot because personality is not, it's amorphous. It's, it doesn't have a, f 
have a shape. Even though I guess we could theoretically convey personality through a shape, but you know, just by association. Uh, you know, obviously Pixar's uh, uh, Inside Out does that pretty well, given character design. But I think in the end, it's like thoughts, how people are thinking, emotion, empathy with other people. That's just something that's like. non-malleable i mean it is malleable i guess but it's it, it's it, it's not of this world it's not a physical thing and we're able to communicate and and capture something like that through through the through the art of animation isn't i don't know isn't that kind of cool anyway i believe that's the kind of stuff that motivates us a little bit um there's just a certain magic that we all are attracted to for animation when it's like oh we first did our first animation whether it's a flip book or whether it's like a bouncing ball or whatever Whatever it is, my God. Um, yeah, hope that answers that question. Uh, we are at 40 minutes and I believe actually what's interesting is I started this uh, challenge 15 minutes late. So even though we're at 40 minutes, which is before an hour, I would, I, I'm assuming I'm done here. And I'm just trying to render it out because I'm using the green screen green screen oh actually no i started like five minutes or ten minutes later or something so i still have some time but i realized that i do have very little time because i need to put it into after effects and i want to put an effect i want to put in a smoke effect as well as a flash effect for when he gets hit just for you know impact sake just for like communication but actually let's um let's kind of rewind a little bit and um i was answering i was answering this question while we're just going through this let me just quickly i'm gonna quickly scroll through this quickly yeah you don't see you can't see me work here okay so we're gonna go back a little bit time code we're gonna come back over here to to this section uh to refocus a little bit i am now at 29 30. this is for the editor sorry this is for me to edit back in to go back um, so I'm animating a little bit more drag on the feet here. I think because we've splined everything already, um, I'm really just trying to get, we could, cause we got the, we got the root going down, right? So the root is it's in a standing position. It turns a little bit to the left screen, right? And then looks up. Then as the sword comes up and then comes down, it gets hit and the root needs to go down on the ground, pop up because of the force, then bounce back down. Once that's like solidified, then we just come in with the arms and we have to ask ourselves, okay, are the arms following or are they leading? In most of the cases, they're following. They might lead a little bit in the section where he's like active. Remember in the situations where we have leading actions with the arms or anything, that's because the arms are conveying intention and uh, thought for something that's going to happen prior. So for example, if I'm reaching for something, your arms will go first as your body follows normally, right? Uh, but in this situation, not much is happening. He's not really thinking too much, just following the, the the motion of the sword. So, you know, in this situation, his arms are just going to drag. And then even more so when he gets hit physically, if he gets hit in the body first, the body will have to go first. Arms will have to drag. And that's what I was authoring there. Right here, I'm author. I'm trying to pose in a little bit of breakdowns on the arms. So you can see here, it's like the arms are side to his side. What I want to do is do a slight cha shape, shape change that... He comes to his extreme as he looks up a little bit. And then so his arms come up, they open kind of like more of like a, Ooh, what's that kind of thing? Ooh, Ooh, you know, so, so going from like a stick, a stick up down to an open a shape a little bit, right? Just, just a little bit. Uh, the, this layering in basically just gives a little, the character a little bit more breathability and, and like liveliness. If you have nothing moving, during these moving holds, it's one of those things where it's like then the, then the object feels or not not organic. It feels like a immovable thing. Uh, you'll also have noticed that while we were just like sort of like splining all the roots and stuff and like that, I was doing a lot of this like uh, offsetting of the rotations and then doing an S and doing sort of a making sure that the motion feels like a swoop, right? Instead of being just a rotation like left right, if you're doing a left right, what you want to do is you want to take take a breakdown that goes from right left or from the god 
uh, we're going to be looking at this screen left to screen right. Screen left, you're going to be on the left side. And then as you go to screen right, you can go down, up. So your final pose is up, looking up. But you want to sort of track the nose or the eyes or the tip of the head. And instead of going straight in a linear fashion, think about curves. Think about something where it goes down, up, down, up. And if it goes down up, it's just like motions from point A to point B. If you can make it a curve or a swoosh, things just feel a lot more natural. Um, almost nothing in life goes in a straight line unless you're a robot. If you're a robot, then go in as many straight lines as you like. Anything organic, though, is always, it's always like it's always a system of softness that relate to one another, right? Obviously, some things are harder than others, but as we know, even bowling balls, when they get hit, have squashed and stretched to some degree. Um, <laughs> bowling balls maybe is a bad choice. Basketballs, golf balls, tennis balls, all these things, you know, even just normal heavy objects do have some wear and tear and, and, get, and give. Um, but... Uh, yeah, so in this situation again, um, I he comes to the left. He comes from left to right. He's looking up. As the sword is doing his extreme, it does an antic, coming up, comes straight down. As it comes straight down, uh, I put in a acting beat for QB to be like, oh my god! And then hopefully you can hold that for about three frames. I believe the reactions from human beings, we need something to hold for at least three frames probably four um, at minimum for something to read ideally something around five six is 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 to give breathing room for these kinds of things but if we're really strapped on time as well as like space like speed then four I, I find that three or four is like the limit of what you can get away with so especially if you're tweening into it or like easing into it um, you can you can cheat a little bit but for something like that it needs to, it, you need a you need to hold on it for it to read before it happens um because then again the humans also react when they when they register it it's they're registering it after it has happened so it's not about reacting to it as it's happening it's about understanding what has happened and that's the funny thing about like human reaction right it's because it's like Oh, that happened so fast. But as long as I understand that it happened and that it feels good on the reaction, then we're good to go. Um, but yeah, and then here you can see I'm just like fiddling with the path of the sword, polishing that. <sighs> uh, another question that was asked is by Ohitsne. Ohits. Ohitsne. I completely butchered that name, but uh, asks if you had to start your animation journey over again, what things would you focus on the most? Um, if I were to start it over again, I would really, 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 really recommend again just focusing on the fundamentals. Um, when I started out early on, I asked my teachers, "Hey, how fast can you teach me to get into the industry? I want to get in the industry. I want to get in the industry. I want to get in the industry." And uh, eagerness is fine. You know, young people are always eager to improve and you know, be rec recognized for their abilities and skills. But in the end, I think again, uh, it's important to not be too attracted to splendor and, and compliments. We definitely really, really, really want to make sure that we are worthy of those compliments in the future. And the best way to do that is to start from the beginning and make sure you're building your building blocks correctly. So really, really understanding bouncing ball. Even if it seems easy, you can always give yourselves more iterations and more challenges to make it more difficult, to make it more comprehensive and complete. But we definitely, it is interesting because for art, uh, at least for animation, animation, technically speaking, especially for 3D is a little bit of a very young, young field and so we haven't necessarily developed tried and true methods and, and methodologies of learning and teaching and pedagogy right um i i'm very thankful for the education that i had for for what i do for my work but was it perfect no 
and uh, obviously even even if something is is been around for a very long time it doesn't mean it's right um you know look at look at our current normal education system ah but uh it is imperative that our understanding of at least the 12 animation principles is as solid as it can be um before actually like doing much else it's one of those things where it's like understanding it also just understanding it is one one thing but then being able to apply your understanding to the medium right so for example even though i understand animation concepts if you ask me to draw it like in 2d or like with you know for anime i i just give up because that's that takes a whole nother skill set and that skill set is part of the translation of thought and intention your ideas from your head onto paper um that's just pen mileage right you just got to keep practicing and that's just like learning a language how do we take what we have in our brains and then put them onto paper or onto the screen how do we share what we want to communicate and that specifically is through education right um, i mean this does bleed into just like overall education uh overall education with people and our in our normal system just like intelligence and reading knowledge uh, but I mean, in this situation, we're talking about specifically about just animation. Um, if you don't know the principles of animation and don't know how to apply those into a 3D animation scene, if the, you're a 3D animator, there's no way you're going to be able to do any work, right? And so at the very least, that's our responsibility to, uh, to learn that. And the first step is to, to get the basics right. Um, I personally spent about two years doing that kind of stuff before I started working professionally. And even though I'm doing okay now, I think I kind of am very sad that I didn't have more time to, to be a student, to continue learning at that level. Um, I got pulled out pretty quickly, I feel like, which I guess I'm great. I'm grateful for because a lot of people sometimes are stuck. Um, riot blessed me with the opportunity to start working for them pretty quickly um but yeah uh la, 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 la. joanne asks where and how did you develop your sense for good editing because your reels and videos are always banging oh again thank you for the compliment i appreciate the kind words um so i mean for me i've always been I've always been tangentially related, uh, like present for a lot of uh, art stuff. I know, for example, like I used to draw a little bit when I was growing up, uh, but then when I was um, in middle school, I was really into sort of like computers or just like doing art on computer. So, I mean, one of the things I did in high, in middle school was actually be, I was part of a newspaper, um, a newspaper. Oh, I know. In middle school, I was. Middle school, I actually was part of the newspaper design team. And I basically laid out the paper um, for middle schoolers. Um, so I was learning InDesign. Holy shit. That was such... Oh, no. The first thing was Paper Maker. God, that's such an old software. Paper Maker, I believe. And then I switched. we switched over to InDesign, which is the first Adobe product I ever learned to use. I learned how to use Adobe stuff through InDesign. Then through InDesign, I learned how to do Illustrator and Photoshop. But InDesign was the first thing. Um, and uh, that was funny because that translated to high school where I tried to be I tried to be a journalist, but I was so antisocial as a journalist. Like I, I was too afraid to approach people and ask them for interviews. Like, hi, I'm writing a story for the school paper. Would it be okay if I interviewed you and asked you a couple questions? I could not do that. Oh my God. That just killed me every single time. So eventually I, I, I brokered like a, a deal with um with my editor in chief and like the, the 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 teacher that was like sponsoring the 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 class and stuff because i signed up because i thought it'd be good for me but i just didn't have the guts uh, so i brokered a, a deal i was like oh you know i can switch i'm good at these things i can maybe help design and be the design lead for for the pay school paper and they're like okay sure maybe let's try it out 
Unfortunately, that's what I did for the next like two two years or so, two three years. Um, but you know, in high school, uh, in high school, okay, going back to twenty six. <laughs> Sorry, we're gonna replay this again. I I thought I had more footage to cover here, but I'm just gonna talk. Um, because I enjoy, this is this is nice talking about. My past, I guess. Hopefully, it's, hopefully it's not boring for you guys. It's like at least somewhat helpful or interesting. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe we share some sort of history um, and experiences. Um, who knows? Um, and then I guess like I was always into graphic design a little bit, so it's interesting too because my interest in this kind of stuff is actually pretty basic and minimal. Aha, minimal. Um, I default to this idea of minimal style, uh, using solid colors, very simple gradients, very simple presentation, just clean cleanliness. And I don't think that's because I, you know, nowadays minimalism is something that is a design choice. Um, like I only recommend people do minimalism specifically if they can do all the other stuff because it has to be an intentional, informed choice to do minimalism. However, I'm not as good designer. I'm just a noob and I'm just like, a, I do bare minimum, reach this level. So the tool that helps me do that is just minimalism because it, 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 it requires less work. Like if you ask me, Christopher, can you rotoscope this thing or like paint in this thing into ever like redo this and redraw? I'm like, no, 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 I can't. Just let me, let me just, Put a solid color on the background and maybe a gradient because there's there's a wand tool and a line tool and i can do that um i guess the only other thing about that is like i used to be very very into making videos and i i mean uh as a camera person i always like recording stuff i was always really interest, interested in cinematography cuts and pans and all that stuff and at least for video games specifically for like league of legends we don't really have too many tools to do that kind of stuff but it's pretty simple to sort of hack in simple versions of that, right? You don't need anything to, to be too complicated. Um, to do a pan, you just need like something to go straight left or right. Um, to do a spin around, you just need to make sure that your your rotation and your uh, uh, strafing is like ratioed correctly. So you get a spin turntable. And again, these things are not meant to be distracting. What you want is for them to support the motion subtly. Um, and this is specific for presentation. This is not for necessarily storytelling or for like cinematography in like a in like an actual short or movie because that's all different. Because that's the character, the camera in those situations is actually an act. Like it, it is its own character because you need the person to follow all the action, all the emotion. They are representing our perspective most of the time. But for presentation purposes, we just simplify it. We just like simplify and make it like straightforward. And you add a little bit of motion just to keep people interested. When pixels are moving, people are interested. When pixels are not moving, it looks really boring. So for motion, this is one of those things where you just like you just layer in a little bit of the extra, extra spice. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like pres like in terms of like uh, the recalls that I present on most of my reels, I always do a little bit of a turntable because if you don't do that, it just feels so dead. And so if you record it and you actually do something where it's like it has a background and you have context like location and stuff, you can always, if you have no moving camera, you can always just do like a scaling of like uh, like 95% to 100% or something over a couple of seconds um, from, for just the image because if you have no camera motion you can fake a zoom in a very slight zoom in which keeps people focused the cool thing about zooms and stuff or a rotation around a point is that people will naturally look at the point that you're circling around or at the point you're zooming into so if usually that's in the center but if it's in the corner to look at the corner if that's your point of like scaling so this is also how you can help get people to focus on the thing um Again, it's like all about smokes and mirrors. It's all about how can you hide the crappy stuff, but get people to focus on the cool stuff, right? It's just, uh, it's magic. 
Um, and then outside of that, I've always liked anime and music videos and stuff. So I guess like in terms of music and then like the sense of like pacing and whatnot, I just, again, my understanding of it is very basic. I always cut on beats. Like I just find music that I like and I cut on beats. That's the easiest thing to do. And sometimes I feel like, oh, cut on the action, cut off the beat, etc. That's all very complicated. I, someone who's much better at that stuff can probably give more feedback and critical critical thoughts on like exactly what would be best in those situations. But I would say for me, I guess like I have had interest in a lot of these different areas for a very long time. And I guess fortunately, I'm in a in, in a position where I can sort of use a little bit of that and amalgamate amalgamate it together um, in these situations. So yeah, I I did grow up also. In middle school, learning how to use a use a uh, God, what were those cameras called? Handheld cameras, handhelds, um, and putting them into iMovie, learning how to video edit, and that that was all in high school, uh, middle school actually. And uh, yeah, those skills. It's interesting how how skills that you learn when you're very young translate and come back to you in the future sometimes, right? So there's no harm, I think, as a kid, if you have the resources and opportunities or even just the curiosity just to chase and learn about things that you normally wouldn't. Right. I think that's uh, we should all encourage young children to do that. Because first off, at that age, they can learn it. Um, they soak up information like sponges. Um, and then also just they have the energy. They have the energy and like time to do so. So why not? Uh, PJ Herrick one two one nine asks, "How do you feel as an Asian American per as an Asian person in the gaming industry?" Oh. that probably I'll have to answer in a different capacity sometime in the future. I feel like it's a very, 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 very complex question and complex answer however it's only complex mainly just because like my perspective on it is just my perspective and i'm trying i do really really want to be very considerate about all the other kinds of like thoughts about uh, thoughts that people have about this kind of issue um all i can say is that from my perspective i have been blessed to not necessarily be very affected negatively about this um, this has a lot of things to do with either like perhaps because I'm also a male, uh, perhaps because of the place I work, perhaps because um, I'm fortunate enough to have resources to, you know, live in a safe, safe environment and all these different things. So in terms of my exposure to sort of like having sort of negative opinions about being an Asian, I, I mean, I grew up as an Asian American and I know like, for example, in my middle school, I was the only Asian out of like, uh, uh, out of 80 people, 80 to 100 or 100 so people in my grade, I was the only Asian. Uh, I definitely wasn't really bullied too much, I think. Um, so I've been blessed about not having to suffer from that. Uh, in terms of the gaming industry, again, like I have not been to many, many companies. I've only been working at Riot and for, I would say at least in that capacity, Riot has treated me not as if I am Asian, just as that, just only as if I'm a good animator and I do my job well and I'm a good rioter like that is all I can really say um, now in terms of my opinion in terms of like the state of um, uh, the state of uh, colored people in the industry and just minorities uh, that that can always be improved I think um, and that takes it one it takes time it takes effort it takes uh involvement by everybody uh but i i, yeah, I get it. i think this topic specifically reaches into a lot of different areas and that would require a much much more in-depth answer but i do appreciate the question i think for the capacity of this video which we have already actually oh my god have already hit one hour um wow i've been speaking to myself for one hour isn't that is that just, man, <laughs> God. All right, uh, last question here is from Tom. Uh, it says, favorite animation? 
My favorite animation. Um, I... I mean, okay, so recently I think, like, I think off the top of my head I would say, like, Arcane is freaking, like, one of my most favorite animations. And this is, this is a lot because of just, like, the content. Um, it's really up, it's really up my alley. And I just love League IP. I just love the characters in League. And I just think Fortiche just did a stellar job on the entire freaking thing. Like... Not only from a technical aspect, from but just from like just like an emotional storytelling aspect, it is really truly one of the greatest animation like achievements that I can think of in the top of my head in my lifetime that comes around. Right, I've only been around for thirty years, but like um, in terms of just experiencing these things, um, and then yeah, you know, you, you have uh, things like um, what is it? Uh, Spider Verse, Spider Verse, the tune trailer, tune trailer just came out, right? That is spectacular too, right? Just splendid, just so, so much love, care, character, so much, just animation, style, spunk, and is not, it's not just superficial. It's all in support of the storytelling method, um, the characters the the emotions that we want to evoke and drive uh respecting the heritage where it comes from it's just it, it you know animation is so much more beyond just the actual like craft itself it's it's almost like any kind of art art is so valuable in, in the sense of like the time and the place the history right and what or like the statement is trying to convey how it connects to humans their emotions, their thoughts, their dreams, their desires, and all that stuff. Like, isn't that just fascinating? So, at that level, I think Arcane comes up recently as one of my favorites. But obviously, like my favorite animation of all time, basically, is like uh, is Nashika the God of the Wind from Miyazaki. This was prior to Ghibli. It actually was like a it was a precursor to Ghibli in terms of just being like a proof of concept for like, oh, can we make a movie? And then blah, blah, blah. And they did. And then they started making movies. Um, that is my favorite, with hence my handle, Omu. Uh, but I think like that movie itself is just more of a personal, oh, I grew up with it. And that's what like I love so much about so many things. Um, one of my favorite films uh, that I tell everyone to watch, if you have not watched, is... Uh, Mamoru Hosoda's Wolf Children. Um, it is a very beautiful family tale about a mom and her two kids uh, and how she raises them, motherhood. That is a theme that I am a sucker for. Families and moms. Uh, I love my mom very much, so I have very deep resonance with a lot of these kinds of films, and I think. And I, I also eventually definitely want to become a parent become a father but who knows when that'll happen uh and then yeah i mean like i have a couple of other animes that i do enjoy like um i like hibike euphonium hibike euphonium is a very very wonderful anime by kyo annie uh again a lot of my animations that i really like they just touch upon a lot of topics that are personal to me uh he became euphonium touches on the band aspect of music and they touch upon like high school joining a band getting better at band learning with your peers and then ha and trials and tribulations as well as like just going through high school that stuff that that like connects with me very hard because that's what i experienced growing up and i think that's where all that stuff comes from right um things that you empathize with and connect with um and that specifically is what makes things memorable and unique. Uh, and, you know, I mean, that's uh, slightly separate from animation quality because animation quality can be good or bad regardless of uh, that element. But these are all these are all animated very, very well. Um, I did recently watch from also from Mamoru Hosoda uh, Bell in theaters, and I would highly recommend watching that because it's, it's one of those things where like movies nowadays in animation they're all all shooting from the moon like they're all just trying to outdo one another which is like both good and bad i would say mostly good uh we're all trying very very hard to to do the new next big thing to keep pushing the medium and i think that's very 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 exciting okay 
you. Um. I'm going to quickly load something up. I've answered all the questions. I'm going to load up the compilation. And I'm going to, for, for purposes, for editing, I'm going to cut. So, uh, with the snap of my fingers, we'll have the video up and we'll be looking at it. One, two, three. Ta-da! All right, so we're here. This is the uh, compilation of all our things and very, very cute. Um, you can see down here that the animator, uh, what is it called? Credit, animated credit is in the bottom left and then the prompt is right below. And uh, it's very, very, very cute. So cute. Let's turn on some audio. Um, but yeah, all of these are so adorable. And let me see if I can loop this too. Loop, 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 loop. Uh, but yeah, the final thing is that everyone had one hour. Everyone basically approached this assignment in very different ways, right? You can see some of them in the beginning are blocked. Some of them are splined. Some of them are splined very simply. This one is so adorable. Adam did such a great job by just duplicating um, the characters and then giving them different colors, adding a lot of just the storytelling beats of what you need, just like some like the extreme poses, the graphic text, the uh, boom, boom, boom on the thing. Ah, oh, just amazing. Oh. Um, this one by Vanessa. You can see, for example, with the one hour, there's a lot of extra work being done here to um, get the, the, the entire like story scene set in, right? Like you wanted the whole cart with the wheels and everything. That itself takes time. So in the end, the animation itself is very is a little bit on the simple side, but perfectly, perfectly adequate for conveying zombie, right? Uh, Nakir did a very cool thing where it's like almost like Adventure Time kind of esque thing, uh, costume, finding something, and like oh my god, what's this? Donning it on. You can see how like uh, with just a couple few poses. The hobble, the pickup, pickup pose, display pose, put on like the look, the prepare pose, the spins, and then the final pose. Ah. With very very little, you can you can communicate a lot, right? Uh, spider, perfect. I love how Alex here just did a lot of just like really trying to make the character not feel so cube really really trying to offset like the poses asymmetrical stances just making it organic and keeping the eyes different sizes it's just it adds you know kind of like the the blue sky blue sky nest well you know just blue sky dreamworks uh not dreamworks sony sony animation just like crafting every frame right do you see the little spider at the bottom too little spider just like yeah Texture, texture is great. Lana doing the perfect loop of the wind passing through. You can see how like it's interesting too. You can always you can approach the project so differently. You can animate the actual character very simply, but then animate everything else around it. That's how you get wind. Isn't that genius? Like the actual motion on the character is very minimal. You just add a little bit of texture with the wave, the, like the intensity of the wind, and then put all the other objects in the background. <laughs> the context is what makes it important. Uh, yep. These are all so adorable. And yeah, I guess we can also just look at mine. The last one, I think when we look at this one, the looping. 
Uh, I feel like I'm pretty pretty happy with how it came out in terms of motion. I feel like the overall motion is what I focused on, and then it came out pretty nice. I do think that I push a lot of the like the expression and the posing, and this is actually something that I talk about all the time, which is like for me, I feel like my posing is not my strongest suit. There are so many other animators out there that have really good sense of posing, dynamism, and just like like uh, appeal. Uh, I am definitely not necessarily one of those. I'm, I feel like I've been trained and I've grown in a way where I'm a lot better at like understanding how motion works via gameplay as well as like how motion trans transitions in and out of stuff um, and getting things to feel very natural and realistic when in motion. Um, I personally feel like that's my strength because um, I feel like I, I that's how like my, my brain just auto senses that kind of stuff uh i sometimes have fear of like really breaking out of my creative creative box and just like breaking things or just really being okay with expanding my understanding of how to how to express things um but you know i think that's what that's not that's, that's just testament to how we all have things to work on right um i personally I'm still growing, still learning about so many things, um, but it's all part of a process, right? Okay, it's almost 1 a.m. now, so I'm gonna try to wrap this up. I appreciate all of you guys. If you guys have been watching this all the way till the end, I hope I provided some value for you. I hope that this was somewhat interesting. Um, do let me know if you pref you kind of like this format. I just wanted to do this kind of thing, have a little bit of a chat. Um, it's definitely not something I made might do all the time. I feel like just having something where it's like a chit chat for an hour could just be a stream maybe or whatever, but also not necessarily just like YouTube content. Um, Cause definitely this was that, this was completely ad lib. There was zero planning, zero organization. And I, I thought that that would be a good opportunity to try doing that just because a lot of my content that I true do make is a little bit too prepared. A little bit too forced sometimes i feel like uh and so i treat that content as work and then it makes me feel so exhausted and tired every single time i have to focus on that because i'm just so tired from work just normal work i don't understand how people can moonlight and do do like vtubing and 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 content creation on the side it, it makes no sense to me if you have a full-time job and you're doing this stuff in addition so i guess i don't know maybe young people nowadays are just built different it's totally possible. Totally possible. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, that's the same thing for streaming. I think for me, I stopped streaming a little bit in the recent months just because like one, I had live things going on, but then two, it's like, oh, somehow just like animating. I try, I really, really tried really hard to make the animation portions of three hour, like on Sunday, three hours, like fun for me. And I think they were, but I think I got, I got caught up in my head about trying to like, present make sure that the presentation of it was like perfect and like like i don't know there's an element that i think like i do have to like source my own my own energy and fun uh and use that as a driver because if i don't find it fun other people will not find it fun and i think that's what i'm trying to figure out right now what kind of mix of seriousness slash casualness is like appropriate um but yeah Hopefully that's something that we'll be like approaching in the next year, uh, 2022. I hope to return to engaging with you guys a little bit more. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see. Anyway, I, I do think that that is uh, going to wrap it up for me for now uh, in terms of content. Uh, I believe I'm uploading this roughly, roughly before Chris, Christmas and the holidays. So I guess as a closing message, I do hope and I do wish no matter where you are in the world and what time zone you live in, uh, even if you, whatever holiday you celebrate, I do wish you guys a happy holidays, uh, a safe break if you have a break and a, uh, very warm uh, hopefully, uh, New Year's, 
and I will see all of you guys in 2022. Thanks.